A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And because of that, we rejoice continually. It's so good to see you here this morning. Uh, it's, good to, it's, it's good that you are here with us. And if you're visiting with us, then welcome. Uh, we'd like to invite you back at any opportunity that you may have to join us and be a part of, of our worship service here. And we ask that you uh, fill out one of, the, um, one of the visitor's cards that is on the pew in front of you. Fill that out, and, and you could uh, give that to me in the back after, the, after service or pass that to the center aisle, which is at whichever is convenient for you. That's just so that we can express to you how much we appreciate you being here with us this morning. This morning we're continuing our series uh, that we started a few weeks ago called Created for Him. We've been looking at our divine God-given purpose. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says that we were created by Jesus, we were created through Jesus, and we were created for Jesus. The Bible claims that to, for us to discover meaning and happiness and significance in life, it must begin with God. Meaning and purpose cannot be found anywhere else. And the Bible claims that when we begin with God to find our purpose, life makes so much more sense. So we're going to be uh, exploring that this morning and diving into that idea even further. So this morning I'd like to open up with this question and I'd like for us to think about it. Does God desire your happiness or does God desire your holiness? Does God desire that your heart sing with satisfaction and joy and pleasure and happiness? Does God desire that? Or does God rather desire that you be holy, that you be set apart from sin like Christ? Does God desire your happiness, your ultimate happiness, or, God, or, or does God desire your ultimate holiness? Most people in this world, in this world, living in this world, believe that holiness and happiness are separate issues, that they are not directly link, linked. They believe that you cannot have both of these. You cannot have both holy and happiness. You can only have either one or the other. However, that is not what the Bible teaches. Holiness and happiness, we see from the beautiful uh, riches of Scripture, we see within the teachings of Jesus, holiness and happiness are linked. And we're going to explore this morning how that is true and how this truth is connected to our divine purpose and our divine calling. When we look at our divine purpose, what God's will for our lives is, we see that God desires for us to be holy. God desires for us to be sanctified, which is a process of being made holy like Jesus Christ. That is God's will for us, as we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. So turn with me there, if you will. It was read for us a moment ago, but we're going to read it one more time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Paul says, for this is the will of God your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his, bo his own body in holiness and in honor. Sanctification is not a normal word, is it? It's not a word that you would see in the newspaper or it's not a word that would you, we would use in daily conversation. It's a Bible word. And sanctification, it, it, it means it's the process. It's a process of restoring our divine image that was lost in the fall, making us holy. When sin entered the world, when sin, when sin entered the world, it corrupted our God-given image that, that God had created us. God created us in His likeness. He created us as image bearers that reflect His nature and His glory. Sin distorts that image, and it's distorted the image, the beautiful God-given image of every single creature that God has made in His image. And sanctification is the process that God, uh, that God is involved with 
is the process of restoring this God-given divine image, making us holy and separating us from our sin-filled nature that we've embraced by our own choice. This is God's will for us and enables us to become like Him, which is our God-given purpose. We were created to become like Jesus Christ. And sanctification is the process that gets you there. And we're going to be talking about that here for a brief moment. Sanctification happens, like I said, in three phases. It's a process. It happens in three phases, the Bible teaches. Turn with me to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. The first stage of sanctification that the Bible makes known to us is positional. Positional sanctification. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, it says, And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. Sanctification, positional sanctification rather, is a one-time act of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of unbelievers in the waters of baptism who respond to the gospel call to be saved. When I am baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and I receive forgiveness of my sins and I'm just and I'm made holy and pure in the, in the eyes of God and I now have a right relationship. I cross that threshold from a wrong relationship to a right relationship. I have been positionally sanctified in the eyes of Jesus. My sins are washed away and I now relate to God positively contrary to the way I did prior to my baptism. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, It says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. He has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Positional sanctification happens at the moment of your conversion. It is when the blood of Christ is applied to my sinful soul and I am saved by God's grace through my faith in the waters of baptism. There's positional sanctification and it happens at the moment of conversion. That is the first step in the, in, in the Christian's process of being made holy like Jesus Christ. Positional sanctification. The second phase that the Bible teaches us of sanctification is called progressive. Progressive sanctification. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Sanctification, this verse tells us, is not just a one-time event. It is a one-time event in the category of positional sanctification in which I cross that threshold from a wrong relationship to a right relationship with God. But further, we know from the teachings of the Bible that sanctification is not only a one-time event. It is also an ongoing, continual process. It is a transformation of my heart and my mind into Christ's likeness. And Paul makes this point in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, that's so very important for us who are undergoing the process of sanctification, of being made holy like Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, And have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator. Our divine God-given image that was lost because of sin and distorted because of evil is now being restored. Our sinfulness is being untangled in a process that's called sanctification. And this it's a and and this is not just a a, a quick, easy process, the Bible teaches that sanctification is a progressively slow process. The Spirit of God works through the Word of God over a lifetime, over the span of my entire life, to renew my mind that reflects the heart of Jesus Christ. That's why, brothers and sisters, that it's so very important for us to remain patient 
to remain patient in our process of sanctification. Many people who are baptized, uh, they come out of the waters of baptism uh, with, with passion and, and zeal, and they want to serve Jesus, and they want to abstain from sin. And then they quickly realize that their old sinful habits come back pretty quick. They still have struggles. They still have hardships. We need to recognize that God sanctifying us by His Spirit through the Word of God is a slow process. It's not a quick, fast fix to your old sinful habits and your old sinful ways. This process that God has given to us is, is slow and it takes time because we have a lot to unlearn. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, Paul makes this point again. He says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, not that I have already obtained this sanctification, holiness, or am already perfect, but I press on, he says, to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul himself was being sanctified, was in a process of sanctification even as he ministered to other people. And Paul claimed, that, and this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about, the guy who wrote uh, the majority of the books in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul claimed that he had not reached perfection, that he had not reached holiness like Jesus Christ, but that he pressed on rather to attain everything that Christ desired for him. Sanctification is progressive, and those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ and are clothed with his blood are in a slow process of becoming like Jesus. And this my brothers and sisters, is our purpose to become like Him. And the Spirit works on our hearts slowly, very slowly, over the course of a lifetime to make us like Him. And lastly, the last phase of sanctification is final sanctification, the Bible teaches us. And we see this in many passages in Scripture, uh, but uh, we will look at one uh, here in a moment. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us of final sanctification. Paul says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That he who began a good work, that work of sanctification on your heart, making you holy like Jesus Christ, that's the context here, God will bring it to completion. It will be completed. You will be fully like Jesus Christ, Scripture says, at the day of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the Bible teaches is to be fully realized on the day when Jesus Christ returns and transforms our lowly bodies to be like His glorious resurrection body. It's then and only then, not in this life, then and only then when Christ returns and gives us our new resurrection bodies in which we will be fully sanctified. And that process, that ongoing process of a lifetime will be complete. Christians, this is our hope. This is what we are looking forward to. Being fully like Jesus Christ being fully like our Lord and Savior, not being affected by sin, having no desire of the flesh anymore, but living in perfect holiness, perfect union with God, our Savior, for eternity, all made possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is our hope. That is what we are aiming for to be like Jesus Christ. And that process, that beautiful process, will only be completed when Jesus Christ returns in the final phase of sanctification. To be holy like Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us, is God's will for our life. This is what we were created to be. 
And when we pursue holiness, when we pursue Christ-likeness, and when we continue down our process of sanctification and look forward to that ultimate day when we are fully sanctified and are made holy like the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that we are fulfilling what we were created to be. We are reflectors of God's nature. We are image bearers of God as seen in Christ Jesus. This is our purpose. Now let's get back to the question that we asked a moment ago. However, with all of that in mind, being holy like Jesus Christ, undergoing this process of sanctification and being made into the image of Jesus, it does not exclude happiness. It does not exclude pleasures. It does not exclude ultimate joy. I want to ask you another question and think about this with me. Who is the happiest person that you think has ever lived on this earth? Who is the happiest person that has ever walked the face of our planet? Maybe many people come to your mind. The Bible tells us the answer to that question, in fact. The Bible tells us the answer to the question of who, in fact, was the happiest person. And we see that in John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus says, and this is Jesus Christ, he says, These things I have spoken to you, he says, that my joy, that the joy that he has may be in you, and that your joy may be full, that your joy may be overflowing, as is Jesus Christ's. Jesus was the most holy among us, was he not? Jesus Christ embraced perfection. He abstained from every immorality and every sin and every abomination that came His way. Jesus Christ was holy. But also, Jesus Christ was, the Bible tells us, the happiest person, the most joy-filled person that has ever lived on the face of this planet. Jesus Christ was the most holy among us, but also the happiness, hap happiest. And we see in Jesus Christ, when we view his nature, what he's like, who he, who he is, we see in Christ's very nature that holiness and happiness are not separate issues. Holiness and happiness are mingled together in perfect union. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 through 9 teaches us the same principle. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 through 9. But of the Son, he says, your throne, just speaking of Jesus Christ, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness. Talking about Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. In other words, you have spent your life pursuing holiness. You have made it your mission to become holy like God is. Is. You have abstained from sin, and you are holy, in fact. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in this context, the companions here is referring to the entirety of humanity, because Jesus Christ pursued holiness and partnered with God, abstained from sin, and did things God's way, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus was the happiest, was overflowing with joy and pleasures and delight because he embraced holiness in the presence of God. Jesus is eternally happy because he is committed to holiness. The Bible does not separate holiness and happiness. They are one in the same. They are one in the same, the Bible teaches. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. David says, You make known to me the path of life. He says, In your presence, O God, there is fullness of joy. There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Bible claims, and this, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. The Bible claims that fullness of joy, in other words, the maximum amount of joy and pleasures and delight that you could possibly experience is found, is found when my heart is in a right relationship with him in 
His presence. Holiness and happiness are not separated within Scripture. They are directly linked. As we travel As we travel down the process of our sanctification, we realize more and more and more as the Spirit works on our hearts through the Word of God, we realize more and more the overwhelming joy that is to be found in Jesus Christ. And as as I travel down this this process of, of sanctification, I realize every single day as my old sinful flesh is torn away from me and I become less like my old self and more like Jesus Christ, I realize how true that is. I realize how much joy more and more and more, the more I am sanctified and made holy like Christ, the more joy I discover living within the presence of God. This is God's design for you, that holiness and happiness are not separate issues. They are directly linked. However, this is the lie of Satan. And this, this, is very, this is very important. This is one of the major ways that Satan lies to us today. The lie of Satan is that you can only experience one or the other. You can only experience happiness or you can only experience holiness. That you cannot experience both of them at one time, Satan says to you. And the gospel, the gospel that Satan preaches into the minds of most people living in the world today, and this is how most people think. This is the gospel that most people embrace, that, that Satan himself feeds to people. He says, to be a Christian... He, Satan says to be a Christian, you must give up wanting to be happy. You must give up wanting to be happy and reach fullness of joy and choose rather to be holy. This is exactly what he did in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 to Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 through 6, it says, But the serp- serpent, Satan himself, said to the woman, You will not surely die, contrary to what God has told you. For God, verse 5, knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Satan wanted Adam and Eve to believe that there was less happiness found inside of God than outside of his holiness. Satan wanted them to believe that if you follow God, yeah, I mean, of course, you'll be holy and you'll have a relationship and all that, and that'll be well and good, but you won't find happiness. Satan wanted Adam and Eve to believe that true happiness is is found in another path, in another avenue. You can't find it if you follow God. True happiness is found if you take this fruit, then eat of it. As God told you not to do, you will be like God. You will know good and evil. And in turn, you will know what it means to be happy, Satan says to Adam and Eve. Satan tricked them into thinking that lasting happiness was found outside the bounds of God's holiness. That is a lie from Satan, a lie from the bowels of hell. And it's being preached to every single person every single day. It's the gospel that Satan preaches to people of the world. This is a quote from, uh, from a preacher that I heard uh, one, one time, uh, speaking of our youth in, in our, our churches, speaking of our young people, he said, our children are leaving the church. And this, there's, the children are leaving the church because of multiple reasons, but this is one of the big ones, he says. Our children are leaving the church because they have believed that to be holy, that to be holy, that to be Christ-like and pursue sanctification, they must forsake what will make them most happy. And this preacher says that our children are buying into this idea, the very first lie of Satan that he throws to Adam and Eve in the garden and are being led away by it. Satan wants you to believe that there is no happiness 
found in God because he knows, Satan knows that your heart is a desire factory. This is the way that we are wired. We desire to be happy, do we not? We desire pleasures. We desire to be satisfied. Satan knows that you are going to pursue what you think will bring you the most pleasure. Satan thinks that if he can make you think that there is greater pleasure to be found outside of God's holiness, he has you. He has you within his claws. This is the lie that most people buy into every single day, that holiness and happiness are separate issues. And the only way that they can reach fullness of joy and f- the full measure of happiness that their heart could have ever, ever experience is outside of God's holiness. Young people, especially, I hope you're listening. I hope you're listening this morning. Young people, especially, hear these verses that I'm about to read. In Psalm 21, verse 6, Psalm 21, verse 6, For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. The Bible claims, young people, the Bible claims that the maximum amount of pleasure that you could experience is only found by pursuing Christ-likeness. Now that does not mean there will not be pain along the way. That does not mean that it won't be hard and the road won't be rocky at times. But the most pleasure and joy that you could experience, and this is the way that God created you, the most pleasure that you could experience is only found in God. Pursue that. Pursue what will make you most happy, not counterfeit happiness, not happiness that that is outside of the bounds of God's holiness that only lasts for a moment and then just gone and vanishes away like smoke or like a vapor, but pursue lasting happiness. Pursue what will make you most happy for eternity. In Psalm 36, verses 7 through 8, it says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. The Bible says that in the presence of God, there are rivers of delight. And we only experience this by pursuing Our primary purpose, we only experience true happiness and fullness of joy as God wishes us to experience when we pursue Christ-likeness, when we undergo this process of sanctification and pursue our God-given image and, and embrace this purpose that He has given to us, then and only then will we Find will we discover what makes our hearts most happy. We learn from Scripture that when we pursue this Christ-like holiness, we become our true selves. Many people believe that today that if you pursue uh, God and, and if, you, if you forsake your old sinful ways and, and embrace His nature and pursue holiness, then that's oppressive. You're giving up who you are and you're becoming some, uh, some, some monk on a mountain that, uh, that, that, that has no care in the world for anybody. That's what many people believe today. But contrary to that idea, the Bible teaches us that when we pursue holiness like Jesus is holy, and when I give give up myself, when I throw, when, when I put off my old self, when I take off the old sinful Keith and I embrace Christ's image and people, when they look at me and they don't see me, but they see Jesus, that's when we become our true selves. That's when we become what we were created to be, when we pursue holiness, when we pursue becoming like Jesus Christ. We become our true selves when we become holy, like He is holy. We're also transformed into a better state of of being. The lie of Satan is that you can only find happiness outside of God's holiness. But God's truth is that holiness and true happiness, not counterfeit happiness, but real happiness is only found in God. And as we are transformed into the image of Jesus, we find this to be more and more true. We are transformed into a better state of being than we were before. 
When we pursue Christ-like holiness, our difficulties have meaning. The things that we go through, the trials and tribulations in this life. When I make my life about pursuing God and His glory and His pleasure and His happiness, and in turn I will receive those things as well, our difficulties and the things that we go through have meaning and have significance as, as, as God is working on my heart and making me perfect like He is. And lastly, when we pursue Christ-like holiness, we are on the right path to discover true joy. The kind of joy that Jesus desires you to experience. The kind of joy that He has Himself and wants every single person on this earth to know. This morning, please know that your purpose is to be like Jesus Christ. This purpose is not discovered by looking within yourself to find meaning and happiness and value. But when we look in God, when we look at God first, and when we look at what what His purpose is for our heart and for our life, we will discover what it means to be truly happy as we are transformed into the image of Jesus and as we become like Him. This morning, if you have any need, if, if you wish prayers from the church, if you wish to, uh, if you, if you wish to make something be known that, that you are struggling with, uh, please let us know so we can be praying for you, so, so we can comfort you. Or if you wish to be baptized, if you wish to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, we urge you, please come forward this morning as we stand and as we sing.